Good afternoon. I'm Jan Leibovitz, and I'd like to introduce Linda Ullman, who's here with me. Uh, we both are the co-presidents of the BNC Phoenix chapter. On behalf of our chapter, we'd like to welcome the alumni, parents, Brandeis National Committee members, and friends who are on this webinar. We want to give a very, very heartfelt thank you to the BNC National staff, Beth Bernstein and Alex Glomset, for partnering with us and our chapter to make this session possible. We want to tell you before we get started, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat and Michael will, will address them. Um, before I introduce Michael, uh, Linda might have a few words to say. I just want to welcome everybody. We're very excited with, with, um, to have Mike here. And I know that there's a variety of people out there that are um, have knowledge of some, some knowledge of air traffic. Uh, we had the privilege of going through this beforehand and I have no knowledge. My husband had some knowledge. My, uh, Jan's husband had some knowledge and Jan has the most knowledge, com not compared to Mike. <laughs> but we just, it was, we take these things for granted. And I just wanted to tell you to enjoy Mike because he's terrific. Nathan. Okay, with that, I, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce my friend and past coworker, Michael Julius. Michael started his career at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Prescott, Arizona. After a year at Embry-Riddle, he transferred to Ohio State University where he received a degree in aviation atmospheric science. Michael began his Federal Aviation Administration career at Cleveland Center, Cleveland Air Traffic Control Tower, and the Cleveland Flight Service Station as a Cooperative Education Program or co-op student. From Ohio, Michael went to work in several air traffic facilities in Indiana. While at Muncie Air Traffic Control Tower, he received several awards for Outstanding Flight Assist and the Above and Beyond Award for the Great Lakes region. He was selected five times to serve as a guest controller at the Experimental Aircraft Association's Oshkosh Air Show, which takes place every July other than this year at, in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Only the creme de la creme of controllers are chosen to work the Oshkosh Air Show, which during those seven days becomes the busiest airport in the world. While working at Indianapolis Air Traffic Control Tower, he served as the liaison to the local Aviation Career Education Camp, or ACE Academy, working with students to familiarize them with science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM, principles necessary for a variety of aviation related careers. Michael also served as a facilitator for the Challenge to Grow Committee and assisted with numerous diversity training workshops within the FAA's Great Lakes region. He moved on to Indianapolis Air Route Traffic Control Center as a traffic management coordinator. Moving onward and upward in his career, he became a frontline manager at Midway Air Traffic Control Tower in Chicago, Illinois, and retired as the manager of DuPage, Illinois Air Traffic Control Tower. Throughout his career, Michael continued to lead ACE Academies, teaching hundreds of students about STEM disciplines and aviation careers, <clears throat> winning numerous awards for his dedication to the students. He truly, truly made a difference in the lives of so many. Michael is an associate professor in the aviation department at Lewis University in Romeo, Illinois, and has taught aviation workshops at Wright Junior College in Chicago, Illinois. He's married to Carla and lives in Aurora, Illinois. He has two beautiful children. Michael Jr. is a pilot, and Aaliyah will attend Ohio State University this fall. Over to you, Michael. Well, thank you, Dan. Thank you very much, and Linda, for inviting me to do this webinar. Um, I'm very excited. This is something I enjoy doing, reaching out to the community and explaining what we do as air traffic controllers. As I go through the slides here, like as, as I said earlier, I was uh, uh, retired as a manager at DuPage uh, Airport. Also, here's a, a brief overview of my uh, past history. I started at Lunkin, Muncie, Indianapolis, as you can say, the other things that Jan has spoke about. And well, let's talk about air traffic control itself. I mean, the simple fact of the matter is that most of us, uh, when you go to the airport, you pretty much just, you know, put your bags in and, and then you go to your gate and, you know, you check in. But there's a lot more that goes on behind the scenes, you know, prior to you even getting to your, uh, 
your things. And like, for example, we're looking at this map here. It's a worldwide map of uh, air traffic across the, across the planet. And as you notice, as the sun is moving, how busy these areas get. As the Asian rim is just opening up, and you see flights coming in from America towards Asia, and then it starts picking up towards Europe, as you see here, and then across the pond, coming across uh, towards the United States, where most of the flights are coming inbound. But keep in mind, the traffic that's over land-based radar is done by radar. That's um, what most people are used to seeing and doing with, you know, that's uh, radio distance uh, detection and ranging radar. And then when you get over the uh, oceans, it used to be that that was also just done by, um, by, by, uh, by uh, doing basically time distance. So you have to report over a fix, report over that fix, and then go from there. And then, you know, basically uh, after you're over that fix, you know, that's how we would track the aircraft. But now we have something called ADSB or automatic dependent surveillance broadcast. Now that was very handy because it's a, an item that goes in the aircraft and basically you're tracked by satellites and satellites can see you and it's a lot more accurate. And the thing we noticed the most like areas over the uh, Gulf of Mexico, it helped out immensely with the helicopters going to from the oil rigs up in uh, Canada over Hudson Bay, Alaska, those areas was, became very accurate. And for areas that typically that didn't have radar or radar stations, it was very helpful for us to the improvement of air traffic. But this is how it gives you an idea what, what we're moving at. And if you notice how during the day, the East Coast wakes up first and then it kind of just works its way across the country. Well, it does that basically around the world. It just basically works its way across. So as we look at this, um, different airspace classes, some of you who are pilots or have some knowledge, you understand that there's different classes of airspace that we use and that basically um, class A, that's pretty much positive control airspace above flight level 180 and uh, flight level 600 as it's stated here or, or better yet above mean sea level. And then you have class E. The best way to understand class E airspace is it's class everywhere. So everywhere where there aren't class B, like class B airspace would be like Boston, New York, Chicago, O'Hare, I'm saying Boston, Chicago, O'Hare, uh, um, or like Washington DC area. And then class C is, you know, for aircraft or airports like Midway Airport, we're a class C airport. And then class D would be something along the lines of uh, Aurora or DuPage or, uh, say Mansfield, Ohio, something to that effect, that's a class D, or Cincinnati Lincoln would be a class D. Now class G airspace, this airspace for airports that, you know, they have airports and then have like uh, flight advisories and stuff like that. And then, you know, no power and then just basically wide open airports fall into class E airspace. Okay. So the phase of flight. Okay, basically the, the best way I could think to explain to somebody who don't really, you know, understand the full phase of flight. It's like if you're in your car and you back your car out of your driveway, that's like coming out of the hangar. You drive down your street. That's kind of the equivalent of going down a taxiway to your main thoroughfare, to your main street. So you, when you get on your main street, it's like getting on a runway. So you take your main street down towards the highway. And right before you get on the highway, you have the on-ramps. Well, the on-ramps are like the tray cons, okay? You, you get on the on-ramp, you look to see what the traffic is like coming on, and then you merge into that traffic. Once you get on the highway, that's the equivalent of being in the in-route sector part of it. So you're going like onto the center. So say if you're driving, say from Aurora to uh, New York, okay, I back out of my driveway, go down my street, get on my main thoroughfare, Okay, get on the highway, on-ramp, like the Tracon, take the highway, for example, Route 80, straight out east, you know, so then you'll pass through, in, you know, Illinois, of course, and then Indiana, then Ohio, then Pennsylvania, New Jersey, uh, across the George Washington, you know, Cross Island, Cross Bronx, and then uh, across, yeah, Cross Island, Cross Bronx. Anyway, and then out to Long Island, that way to the house or to the, to the area you want to get off, you get off the ramp, and then that's like the Tracon, you get on the main thoroughfare, down the street, down to uh, your, your street, turn left, taxi in. That's pretty much the way it works. So as you take off, pre-flight would be at the tower, air traffic control tower, take off, offset the tower, but departure, that would be your Tracon, okay? That'd be your Tracon. Tracon would climb you up and then hand you off to in route. So you'd go from the in route. And then basically when you get towards your destination, the in route would hand you back off to a Tracon, back to the approach control to the tower. So for example, you would say from Midway Airport, you taxi out to the runway, or first of all, you, you get your flights, uh, your, your, uh, 
like Betty, I'll explain that later. You'll, you you taxi out to the runway, okay? They clear you for takeoff, and as you depart, you climb up and you they switch to Chicago Tracon, Chicago Tracon, radar contact, climb, maintain, and they'll climb you up, and then they'll hand you off to Chicago Center. So then you'll go from Chicago Center to Cleveland Center to New York Center to New York Approach to say LaGuardia Tower. Then they clear the land and then to LaGuardia ground and they tax you into your gate. So that's pretty much what the, the, the phases of flight, the way it looks like. And I'm going to go and explain that a little bit more as we, as we go along here. So just bear with me. Okay. So when we talk about the towers, we talked about Midway Tower in particular. <clears throat> and if you notice, uh, there's positions. We call this part of the tower team. So you have flight data and clearance delivery. Okay. And then you have ground control. Local assist. And local assist is normally only open when it's very busy and local control needs somebody to help them, you know, sequence the aircraft, get releases and do things of that nature. And, uh, and then the radar position. So as you look as down here, you see that there's 518 or so uh, uh, control towers. There's uh, 19,622 airports, most of which, if you notice, are private airports. And then this picture down to the lower right is also a picture of Midway Tower, okay? Well, let's go forward. Okay, Midway Airport. As you see here, that uh, basically you got five runways, 10 runways if you count each end. The main, uh, here's the terminal over here. So this is where everybody comes in. And this is the terminal, the gates, you know. So this would be Alpha uh, Terminal, part of the terminal, and then the Bravo, Bravo Gates, and then Charlie Gates, like that. Over here, you can barely see it, is the Midway Tower. Okay, and then over Atlantic Aviation, then you got Signature and uh, AMC also over here. And then on this side, you have the, the main uh, hangars for Southwest Airlines, okay? And then you have your runway and, and like I said, the various taxiways. So basically this runway here is runway 31 Center. That's our main runway for, for uh, commercial airlines. And then four right, that's our other main runway. So that's where we land our 737s, 757s, things of that nature, they land on that. But then you have runway 31 right, this is 31 center, 31 left, four right, four left, okay, and this will be uh, two two right, two two left, and then also one three left, one three center, one three right, okay. Now, when I say three one center, what that's not lined up with is the magnetic heading on your like on a compass. So it's 310 degrees, and that's the runway. So when you line up on the runway, it's 310 degrees. But typically, when you have more than one runway pointing in that direction, they will make them a left, right, and a center. And that's why you only have runway four right and four left over. There's only two runways, but they're both heading in 040 heading. And the other end of the runway is, is pointing in uh, 220 degrees, so 220 heading. And so two, two left, and then two, two right. Okay. And it, once again, this is the tower team. So as you look at the team, here you have uh, your clearance delivery person, handing off strips over to ground control. That's what this gentleman's doing here, ground control. This gentleman's in because we do have weather. That's what you can see on the scope here. That's weather as you look out the window also. That, so he's helping the local controller who's watching the bright, the radar position. And we're on three ones. This is where basically we're set up. And this gentleman back here is the supervisor watching this, the operation. This is the tower team. So the idea is that everybody works together to move airplanes. That's what we do, okay? so. And that's pretty much what it looks like. So let's go into the different positions. Okay. So with this is clearance delivery. So clearance delivery, these are the flight plans. So typically while you're coming up to the airport, parking your car or getting dropped off, the pilots have been there a few hours early. They did their pre-flights. And they, what they would do is send over the flight service. That's a flight service station. They, they'll get a weather briefing. And they'll also put in the flight plan to determine which is the best route according to the weather briefing to fly. So they'll put that in and the flight service station will put that into the system, okay? So when they get to their aircraft, sit down, do their pre-flight checks and everything, they're getting ready to depart or thinking about taxi and everything else. And as you're sitting down in your seat, you know, getting your seat adjusted and everything else, they're up front talking to clearance delivery. So example, Southwest 1193, a Boeing 737, and this is his equipment suffix. Okay, he's going to Las Vegas. Okay, this is his route to Las Vegas. Okay, and so what he would basically do is say, uh, 
Midway Clearance Delivery. This is Southwest 1193, uh, ready to go to Las Vegas at Gate Bravo 19. That's what the B19 stands for right here. As you can see, that's handwritten. So your clearance delivery specialist would grab the strip and then he would read back to him, Southwest 1193, clear to Las Vegas airport via the Midway for departure, then it's filed. Maintain 3000, that's what the three here stands for, and expect, uh, maintain 3000, departure frequency 133.5, that's the frequency they'll use to talk to C90. And then the most important thing here is squawk 1311, that's a beacon. So we put that in what we call a transponder. A transponder in the aircraft is how we're able to follow the aircraft's altitude, speed, and direction. That's how we follow them. And they put this code in there, and this code is synonymous with everything that you see on the strip, plus more with as far as background information and everything else that they give the flight service. And that's how we follow them. So as you look further down, you see this aircraft here. It's a Citation 560X, okay, and his call sign. That's his beacon code, 3545. And as you see, he's going to St. Louis. Well, he's got a full route route to St. Louis. So that in this situation, there was weather. So they had to give him a full route to St. Louis that we would read to him. Once again, you know, the altitude is uh, 3000. And his departure frequency, you see, would be 118.4. That's because he's going to be going out a different direction than the Southwest. Okay. And then the same thing goes for this aircraft down below, which is a Hawker Sidley, uh, November 80 Juliet. And once again, his beacon code, frequency, okay, and then altitude. So then once he's done with that, he takes that strip and he hands it over to ground control, okay? So ground control, at that point, looks at the strip, waits for the aircraft to call him. And when he does, when they usually push back, he'll cock it on his board like this, he'll do that. So let's say, for example, let's move along. So Southwest 1193 calls him for taxi. Says Southwest 1193, midway ground, ready to taxi. Okay, so uh, ground controller would turn around and say Southwest 1193, midway ground, taxi to runway four right. This is runway four right. So now he has to give him a direction, okay, and where to taxi and how to taxi. So he'll say Southwest 1193, since he knows he's parked here, gate 519, taxi via taxiway Yankee, cross runway 31 right, 31 center, and runway 31 left, taxiway Yankee 1. So his route would be taxiway Yankee, crossing these runways, okay, all the way over to taxiway Yankee 1, okay? So say for argument's sake, the next aircraft to call him is Citation 183 Juliet Sierra, located at Atlantic Aviation, what happens to be this building right here, that's Atlantic Aviation. So he would say, uh, Midway Ground, this is Citation 183 Juliet Sierra, ready to taxi, requesting runway 31 Center. 31 Center is not the active runway, and you can tell this by the way, our strip marking, I know you wouldn't know, but by our strip marking, and we show that 31 Center. So four is our active runway. So that's why you don't see a, a, an oval or half a shape over uh, four right. So we would turn to November 3, Juliet Sierra, and say, citation 183 Juliet Sierra, taxi to runway 31 Center, via taxiway Foxtrot 2, Foxtrot, that's just right here, cross the approach center 31 left, Runway 31 Center. So, Citation uh, 3 Julius Sierra would read that back and he would taxi out this way and like this. And since he's not a conflict for the Southwest coming this way, there's no need to mention that to him. Now, however, if this aircraft, the Hawker 80 Juliet, calls for taxi, let's say for argument's sake, he's at Atlantic. So, this is Hawker 80 Juliet ready to taxi, well, requesting four right for departure. Okay, so you say Hawker 80 Juliet. Taxi runway four right via taxiway Yankee one, give way to the Southwest aircraft on taxiway Yankee. So what you're doing is you're saying, yes, you can go from here. We want you to go all the way down to here to go to Yankee one, to go to the runway. But we also want you to give way to this aircraft on taxiway Yankee. That's ground control controlling the aircraft on the surface and vehicles, anybody who works on the airport, they talk to them. So then you would turn to Southwest 1193 and say Southwest 1193, traffic ahead and to your left, will give way to you, contact tower holding short runway four right. And at that time, Southwest 1193 would be passed over to local control. And as you look out the window here, this is the approach in the runway four right, there's your Southwest in position, here's your Hawker jet behind them. You can't see the other aircraft from 31 Center because actually that's behind where she is standing, where the young lady is standing at. Okay, and as you can tell, she's monitoring the scope here, got the air traffic position here, looking out the window. Okay, that's basically what she does. So she would say, 
in the next screen, I'm going to show you this. This is what she's looking at. So here's this dash line that goes like this is actually the, the lake shore. And this is the, uh, the, the towers downtown, downtown Chicago. This is weather. You can tell this is weather because we have it up here on the scope, level one weather. The dots back here, level two. You can set it to whether you have it on, you don't. The most important thing about this is that this is the extended center line of runway four right. Okay, each dash is a mile, each space is a mile. Okay, and it also goes out to out to five miles out from Midway Airport. This is what we call the dump zone. And we use that to stay out of it. So when we know we have to turn aircraft, we turn outside of it because that's where they descend aircraft inbound to the airport. So she would turn to Southwest 1193 and she'll say Southwest 1193, Midway Tower, runway four right, turn right, no correction, turn left, heading 250, clear for takeoff. He's going out over Iowa City. So it's a left turn westbound, westbound frequency. So you take off and go in this direction. Behind him, she would put November 80 Juliet, runway four right, turn right, heading of 130, clear for takeoff. So actually he's going southbound. So he'll come out and go out on a heading like this. Okay. And then um, after that, November 183, Juliet Sierra was on 31 Center. He would depart, but you would wait for the other Southwest to go this way to clear the departure path because this is the extended center line 31 Center. And then you would say November 183, Julius Sierra, runway 31 Center, turn right, heading 090, clear for takeoff. So basically, your southbound would be out of the way going this way, eastbound goes out this way, westbound goes out that way, and you're separated. And meanwhile, you know, that's how we work aircraft out for the facility. So do I have any questions on what I spoke about as far as working at a, at a tower? Any questions? Mike, we have one question that comes in from Ellie, which is, has the number of traffic controllers changed over the years uh, as advances have been made in technology? We still have approximately 15,000 controllers. And right about the strike when, uh, when Reagan fired the controllers, about the same amount. So about 15,000. And as, uh, the, the, as the, um, I would say, uh, technology has gotten better, the traffic has also increased. So we kind of increased the uh, controllers to kind of keep up with that. That's what we have done. And right now they are looking to hire controllers because we had people retire and relatively in mass. So they are looking to hire controllers. A few more questions. One's a quick one from Joan. Do you still use paper flight strips? That is correct. We do use paper flight strips, as you saw the strips that, that were there, but we do have, we have electronic flight strips, and I don't have that on, on this right now, but we do have a situation where we have electronic flight strips. In fact, when you look at this strip here down below, this barcode, when we scan that, that's what prints out over at C90 at the approach control, and their strips can either be electronic up on the screen or they can print out. And let's take one more. Okay. Um, I'm going to combine two questions. What types of training do people need to work in a tower? And then this is just an added part question. What is the percentage of men to women controllers? Okay. Um, the type of work that you need to work in a tower, actually, we have different uh, training for tower, for TRACON, and for the TRACON being the approach control, and then for working at the center. Tower controllers, typically, you're looking out the window. So you've got to be able to, you know, spatially orientate, looking out the window, deciding whether or not you have distance and speed, be able to uh, uh, figure that out by looking at the aircraft, as well as some towers do not have radar systems in the tower. Like, for example, when I was at Muncie, we didn't have a bright radar scope, so we had to use binoculars. So you had to visually locate the aircraft after they told you they were inbound, find them, and then sequence them that way. So you have to have good spatial dis uh, uh, recognition. Uh, the other thing is, um, as far as for towers themselves, you can start off working in a tower and then promote up into a TRACON like I did and into the center like I did. So you can, you can move along in different areas. The basic air traffic is taught to you down at Oklahoma City. So they kind of give you an overview of everything you need to know. And then you, when you're sent to your facility, it's more specialized at the facility. As far as um, percentage-wise for women, in, uh, in the air traffic ranks, I, if I had to say, and I don't know exactly, but I would say somewhere around maybe 20, 15, 20%, somewhere in that range, as far as women are concerned. And you know, as far as minorities are concerned, I think we're at the, a range of about 5%, as far as uh, African-Americans, Hispanics, and things like that, about 5%, so. 
That's great. Uh, you have a lot more questions, but I think we should probably proceed to the next. We'll, we'll, okay, we'll move on to the next bit. Okay, th thank you for asking the questions here. As we go in, we're going to talk about the Chicago Tracon. This is C90. This is what it looks like out in Chicago. Okay. And as you can see, in the Tracon facility that you have also training team or have teams also. So in that area, you could be called the facility or the sector. Okay. And that's why we say Chicago, you approach Chicago departure. The radar position is the person sitting in front of the scope, actually talking to the aircraft. The radar associate is kind of like the local assist person. When they're really busy, they'll have an associate there to do handoff, strip marking, things of that nature. The radar coordinator, the coordinator will work out and say, hey, you know, I got to get this aircraft over here and he'll coordinate, as it says in the name, with uh, maybe another sector or another facility. They also have a tracker and a sequencer, which I will go into later. And then flight data, you know, pretty much every position, every facility has a flight data person or personnel. Okay, so when we talked about those three aircraft, okay, so uh, that was Southwest 1193 going outbound. His outbound would look like the white lines. See the white lines going out. Those are the outbound aircraft from Midway. Red is the inbound aircraft in Midway. And this is pretty much on a, on, a, on a really nice weather day. You see, we don't have any weather in the Chicagoland area. The lines are straight. That's how you know when the weather's good. When the lines are straight, the weather's good. So, you know, Southwest 1193 going out over Iowa City towards Las Vegas out in this direction and down towards uh, Vegas out in that direction, probably more or less right about here. Okay, then you have Citation 183 Juliet Sierra. He came off, he went Aceto, Adele, those are our southbound fixes. And then he would turn and bend them out over by St. Louis and then down towards Dallas out in this area. And then you have 80 Juliet also going out eastbound, pretty much straight out more or less this line, because Pittsburgh's right about here, even though this line goes beyond Pittsburgh, more towards Philly, but he would be right about in here. And that's, that's pretty much what the way they would do it coming out on a day, which is relatively nice. But when they get to a certain altitude, they would only climb onto like 10,000 and the center would take over from there, okay? And then here's a, the radar team. As you're looking at the, the front line, as they used to call it down when I was in the end, you call it the front line. You have your two controllers. And here's that overhead or the tracker position. That's where that's located at. So they would plug in to here where you have an overhead or the tracker helping out the controllers. And that way the cord doesn't interfere with the you know, person sitting in front of the scope. So the other part of TRACON is also the arrival. So let's talk about that. I, I have a, a screen here when we're looking at Chicago O'Hare Airport. As you can see, this is where we are right now with 27 right, uh, 27 center, 27 left, 28 right, 27, 28 center, 28 left. Then you have the cross runways, 22 right, and then two to left. Well, when they're on west flow, meaning they're going in this direction, everybody's going west flow, they will use for the inbound runways, two eight center, this runway here, two seven left, this runway here, two seven left, and then two seven right. So basically they're set up so they can send, and they will favor two seven uh, left and two seven right, so they can launch the south side of the field. As you can tell, that's where the terminal is mostly, so they can send people right out to these ones and go. Okay, so as you can see, these are future runways, existing runways. So what does that look like on the scope? This is what it looks like on the scope, okay? So this is typically, just like I say, it's a clear weather day. They're on west flow, okay? West flow, everybody's going westbound, departures departing towards the west, west flow. And then, they're, like I said, they're landing runway 28 center, which are on the south side, 27 left and 27 right, which is on the north side. So what the two... Uh, positions, uh, oh, four positions actually with this, you have feeders. So you'd have a north feeder and a south feeder. What the feeder does is he takes the aircraft coming inbound from the center and descends them down to say like say 7,000 or so, gets them on what we call a downwind. That's a downwind right there. And then this would be the base and then that would be the final. So they get them on the downwind, get them down to say at this side, because I know O'Hare launches and climbs to five here, or four, yeah, five here, because we're coming out, we're coming to three, so three to five. So basically what we have here is uh, midway. So you would normally have a four post, well, here would be your post, but they don't have a post down here because midway's here, so they're not gonna run over the top of us with this many airplanes. So basically we come out to three, they come out to four, these guys to send down to five, turn to four, 4,000 feet when I say it like that. So, and then they would join the localizer or RNAV inbound, okay? So when they get to a certain altitude here, they would hand them off to what they call the final controller. So if you look back, let me see if I can find that picture. Oh, there's only two people working there. So if this was like the feeder 
here, then that would be the final controller here. The final controller is a controller that I would say uh, five miles from the market, maintain 4,000 established on the localizer, cleared ILS 27, that left approach, if we run ILS approaches. That's what they would do. The feeder controller would get the aircraft down and slowed and in a position where the final controller can turn them in towards the airport. And then you have different work turbulence applications behind the super. A super would be something like the uh, A380. Uh, so you need behind another heavy behind them six miles, a large aircraft like a heavy would be 747, okay? Or behind a large aircraft behind the super, you need seven, so that'd be like a, like a uh, 737. Small would be eight miles behind the super. You would need that and you need eight miles. Small would be like a, a corporate jet, something to that effect. Whereas, you know, behind a large, you need normally four miles and a small behind a, a large four miles, small behind a heavy six miles. But these are things you also have to factor in when you're running your final, you're running your feeder, when you're running your aircraft to sell how many aircraft you can accept at the airport at a time. So that's basically what that looks like. So that's West Flow. East Flow is a show and appear when everybody's going out this way. This map would be basically reversed so that you'd have them all coming in and departing out towards the east and they would be landing one zero right, one zero center and nine left. So that's basically how it would look on East Flow. Okay. Any questions or discussion on the radar approach? Yeah, I have a few that I'm going to combine again because you have a lot of questions. Okay. Um, they're, they're there's a thematic sense here with a lot of questions about what happens when things go wrong. Okay. So uh, there's a question about how are people's uh, skills assessed to be an air traffic controller. There's one about are traffic controllers given periodic health checks um, like pilots are. And then another one that says, what are protections against human error like slip of the tongue and against power or technology failure? Okay, well, every facility that we have, that, that we work in, we have our backup generators. So we have our own power waiting to go. So if we, if we, and we've switched over to that during thunderstorms where you have to go to your own power and the generator comes up, I think it can run for like a day or so as far as that's concerned. So that's one thing. And there are redundancies built into the system. For example, when I showed you the final, for example, the way we did the final at, at Indianapolis, I did not work this airspace. So, but what we would do, we'd have what we call a low side and a high side. So these guys, for example, at Indy, we would descend to 4,000. These guys on this side would descend to 5,000. What that basically did, if you turned them in, towards the airport and you forgot about them. And these guys at four, these guys are at five, they would flow through that side if that happens, okay? So we kind of did certain things along the way to, to look out or to protect for potential errors. I mean, it's just the way the job is. A lot of redundancies in it. I will go and address some of the things that have gone wrong later on. And also I have a little bit in the section towards the end, we talk about certain requirements and things that are needed to become a controller. Aside from that, yes, we get our, our physical. If you're um, younger than, I believe, younger than 30 or 35, I think it is, you get it every other year after 35 and on up, you get it every year. Um, we are constantly, you know, watched and, and given tests and evals along the way for certain things, uh, you know, what they'll come up with uh, as far as headquarters, what they're asking for certain evals on people and what you're doing and so forth and so on. I would say the type of person not to get too far ahead of myself, but to say the type of person that will fit into this job is somebody who has the ability to make decisions quickly and clearly, but more importantly, have the ability to know whether or not that is the right decision. There's a very simple item that we have in uh, air traffic. It's not a mistake until you fail to correct it. So if you make a mistake, which people will make mistakes, fix it. That's why we have go-arounds. That way, we, you know, we put people in holding. That's why we, you know, vector people out of the way. Fix it. That's what you do. And once you fix it, it's like it never happened and you move forward. So like I said, I will address some of that later on in the discussion, but that's pretty much the way, you know, the, uh, the C90 works or the terminal works and uh, the uh, Tracon works. I have one more technical question. Um, the question reads, I read somewhere that runway numbers with L and R need to add up to 36 for 360 degrees total. Some airports seem to have that pattern and others don't. Can you please tell us more? Okay, there's only 360 degrees in, in the mag in the mag compass. All runways are based on 360 degrees. So runway nine is runway zero nine zero is 90 degrees heading. Runway two seven is 270 degrees. So yes, they all fit on a magnetic compass. That's that's the way they work. So if you happen to see somebody live, you know, put three nine zero or three nine on runway, that's that's not legit. 
Okay. And here's one more. It says, why is the, uh, why is the final controller at the Tracon as opposed to the ATCT? Is the final controller able to see the runway and that the runway is clear? Well, okay, the final controller just works the aircraft in the radar scenario. As I said, contact tower at the marker. At the marker, the aircraft switch over to the control tower, as you saw the young lady in the, in the previous picture, and then she would determine whether or not she has enough spacing for departures to get out or to clear the aircraft to land. The tower is separate from the radar from the TRACON. There's really no reason for them to see it. They sit in that room, as you saw in the other picture, uh, I think we have, that's what the room pretty much looks like. That's what they sit in. There's no reason for them to see the runway itself. When they hand them off, the person that they hand them off to is in the control tower, can see the runway, can make the determination whether or not the aircraft has the spacing to land. So let's move on to the next section. We can save some of these questions for the next one. Okay, great. All right, so after you do that, you go to the air route traffic control tower, I mean centers. So uh, as you can see, uh, the you know, air route traffic control centers, there's 21 of them in the country. And each ARTCC is divided into sectors, okay? And as you see the different air traffic control towers, like I said to you earlier about your flight, so if you left Chicago, you went to ZAU, to Chicago Center, to Cleveland Center, to New York Center, to New York Tracon, which will be sitting right about here, which is N90, and then to LaGuardia, then LaGuardia Tower, LaGuardia ground taxi in, but that's how you would transverse the country through these air traffic control centers, okay? So if you're coming up from the south, you go from Miami to Jacksonville to uh, Atlanta, Indianapolis to Chicago Center that way. And, you know, so also out here from Oakland through uh, Salt Lake City, Denver, Minneapolis, Chicago. So as you, as you can tell, they're pretty much just kind of divided up, not along the lines of states, but along the lines of, you know, where the traffic flows and is best the way the traffic looks. Um, so we have different sectors. We have the low from flight level, from the surface up to flight level 230, the high from flight level 240 to 330, and then the super high or the, the ultra high, as they call it, from flight level 340 to flight level 600. And then above flight level um, 290, it used to be everything above 290 and above was all 2,000 feet separation between aircraft. So they brought it down to 1,000 feet with reduced vertical separation minimum due to the fact they had improvements in altimeters and other uh, technology on the aircraft so they could bring them a little bit closer and it was more consistent. The problem before that some aircraft, the altimeters may not act right. So they put 2,000 feet between them because they're moving so much faster at that speed and the closure rate is so great, like at 1,000 knots or greater, that they needed you know, some room to basically um, for error. So now that we have it down to the point where they're very accurate about where they are and how they're located, we'd be able to go to reduce vertical minimum. Okay. So as you look at these aircraft, for example, this Hawker 417 Tango Mike, he's only going as high as 16,000 down towards Peoria. So he would pretty much stay in the low sector. And then you have Southwest 873 going to St. Louis, flight level 260. So he would wind up in the high sector. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you have Swift flight. E-135, okay, Zillia going to uh, Phoenix, he's climbing a little bit higher, so he would wind up in flight level 380 up in the super high, okay? So as we look at the next one, here's a kind of cutout view from, say, Atlanta Center. So for example, just bear with me, for example, Atlanta Center, if you're departing out and you're only going to stay in the low sector, so you'd fly through here from the surface up to, uh, up to uh, flight level uh, 230. So you'd wind up in this area. And if you're going to the high sector, you'd wind up in this area, 240 to 330, and then the super high or the ultra high, three, uh, 340 and above. But if you're climbing through, say, for argument, say, from an airport, you climb through this sector, then you would hand off to this sector. And if you're going up to the super high, you go into this sector, and then you would fly out. And then on the way inbound, say, if he's coming from the super highs, you'll come down through this sector, probably go through this sector like this down through this and down through that, and then to the airport that way or to the approach controls. And what you see here are like approach controls that have that, so they go up to 10,000 feet typically. Okay, so above flight level 600, uh, 600 to flight level 240, you need five miles standard. And then below that, uh, flight level 230, uh, three miles between them, but that's only for certain sectors and certain areas. So this three miles will probably be more or less associated with this one here going in because they're coming out of an approach control and into the uh, center airspace. But typically you need three miles increasing to five miles or five miles in the center airspace. That's typically what you need. 
Okay. And once again, in the Chicago and the centers, you have the sector of the area and, you know, they would all say Chicago center or New York center, you know, something to that effect, but they would work a certain area and then you have the radar position. Okay. Or like this guy, you have the radar position, radar associate sitting there, your flight data specialist are usually at the end of the row. And this individual here would be your supervisor. Okay, so, you know, once again, we're talking about the, 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 the flight and how your flight is arced across the country on a day where the weather is great. As you can tell, it's great when you got straight lines. Okay, going into here, you got these guys lined up here and you have to have aircraft here. Just to have an idea, when I worked at Indy Center at Traffic Management, we had a habit of even lining up aircraft coming into the Chicago area over the Gulf of Mexico. You reach that far out to make sure you can line these guys up because you can't see it on this screen, but these guys actuality, they're all in trail is what we say they are, they're in trail. And once again, talking about the different, uh, the, the way your flight will go, you know, the pre-flight takeoff, departure, landing, so the arc of your flight and then coming back to your destination. Okay, so you got that. And then, you know, once again, like I explained to you in the other slides, how that pretty much worked with the in route, you know, going back from, uh, center to center to center, or even going out west the same way, center to center. And then you hit the approach controller, like going into Phoenix and then to send you down in towards the airport that way. Okay, uh, questions? Sure, I have another couple paired together, one pertaining to physical health and one pertaining to mental health. So the, the first one, uh, how are controllers managing to stay COVID free given how many are sitting next to each other for many hours at a time? And the second one is about how much stress is induced by being an air traffic controller and how does one handle the stress? Um, are there stress reduction classes or frequent breaks? Okay, uh, during the eight hour day, typically you, you may be on position five out of the eight hours of the day. Um, so you do get the breaks as far as that's concerned. Well, let me go back and answer the first question with COVID. What we have done with COVID is they've gone to schedules where they have crews that will work together and they went to a three crew concept at first where you'd work five days, then you'd be off for 10 days as the other crew would rotate in five days, five days in, five days out. That way, if somebody got sick, they could replace the whole crew and put them in that way. Or they went to five on, five days on, five days off. So you have a crew on, crew off, crew on, crew off. So that's the way we did that, not to mention as far as going through the facilities and making sure they were, were clean and, and attended to. Um, as far as uh, dealing with the stress, I myself, I played lacrosse throughout college. I still play lacrosse. So I would spend a lot of time as far as working out, lifting, training, playing lacrosse. But mostly the lifting was very beneficial when it came time to uh, go to work because it is a stressful job, but you have to figure out what your outlets can be and be a positive outlet at that. So that's how I pretty much handle it for myself. Other people do other things of that nature, you know, hiking, you know, jogging. A lot of people have a lot of people like to run marathons and things of that nature you know, to far less do something to exert that, that physical energy from everything else when you're sitting there just kind of tensing up and watching it. But I would say that the type of person, once again, it's, it's kind of a personality trait as far as a controller is concerned. I remember when I went to the academy, the person that finished, I believe, was second in our class. You know, he signed up, took the test, came in off the street. Um, the guy was running a ditch witch. He was running a ditch witch as a plumber's assistant before that, but he had the knack. He could see, as we used to say, see traffic, because when I went through the academy, it was all non-radar. So he had the ability for non-radar fixing, seeing people over fixes and, and seeing the traffic before, you know, it came into conflict and he was good at it. So it's kind of like having a knack for the job itself. Okay. There are another few about international space, uh, international airspace rules. So one, uh, how are procedures standardized uh, internationally and as well? How is airspace over the ocean divided among control centers? Okay, uh, internationally, we have a thing called ICAO, International uh, uh, Air Traffic Association, it's called ICAO. And so what we give for air traffic here is pretty much standard around the world is what the way it's done. Just as English is the standard language of air traffic control. So no matter where you go, you got to be able to speak English over the frequency to, air, to air, aircraft. Um, over the ocean for the United States, um, I, it's too far back to bring that map up, but over the ocean, Houston Center pretty much runs the Gulf of Mexico as far as that's concerned for the United States. Uh, New York Center runs the East Coast. 
as far as that's concerned, off the East Coast, and Oakland runs off the West Coast. They're called oceanic sectors, and the oceanic sectors are the ones that handle the aircraft over the oceans, inbound to the states, and vice versa. So that's pretty much how that's done. And another one I have, um, who picks the overall route from point A to B? How much is pre-planned versus determined on the fly? How much control do the controller have? Okay, uh, the flight is actually put in by the, uh, by the pilots. When they file a flight plan, that's what they're doing. They're putting the flight plan, the direction they want to go, the route they want to fly to their destination. Uh, the time that the flight plans get changed or the route gets changed, and I'll get to that when we look at inclement weather, you have to change the flight. So you might hear if you're sitting and they say, oh, you know, we, we have to wait to see or we have to put on more fuel because of our flight. Well, that means the route has changed. And I will go into that a little bit right after that. Um, that's pretty much how that is done. What was the other part of the question? Um, how much, so how much control does the air control, um, controller have and who determines the route from A to B? Okay. Typically, uh, air traffic control, we have, you know, or the flight service would say, for example, if there's a military operations area that's open, the flight plan, that's where the military would go into these boxes, per se, and practice their maneuvers. And you, sometimes you have flight or routes that go through that that are, that are open when the, when the MOA, military operation area, it's called the MOA, when the MOA is closed, if the MOA is open and they can't, and they want to fly through during that time, they can't, so they have to change the route that way. That's usually when we change the route for that or other special use areas uh, for VIP movements and things of that nature. But pretty much it's up to the pilot to file the flight plan for the route that they want, and we just take what it, what it comes from there. So that's what we do, unless we get into area points of weather, which I will discuss here momentarily. And one last question, just because it's been submitted a bunch. Um, they just There are a bunch of questions about your insight as an air traffic controller uh, around 9-11. Okay. Um, for the record, for 9-11, my wife was in the hospital. So uh, at that day in particular, I was not working that day. But the insight is um, basically what they did was once they couldn't determine the, the friend or foe or the IFF identified friend or foe with the, with the airlines, they grounded everybody. And basically air traffic, what we did, whoever was in whatever center's airspace, that's where you landed. Okay, so if you were in Cleveland's airspace, and even though you were going to LA, you're not going to LA, you're landing in Cleveland. If you're in Indianapolis, you're landing in Indianapolis, you're landing in uh, Cincinnati, you're landing in those centers airspace. So that's what we did with that, grounded it, and then from that point forward, the military took over the rest of the airspace and handled it from there. So I think we can move to your next section. Okay, let's go there. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, so since we kind of touched upon this, with the uh, traffic management unit, that's where I worked at, and uh, the TSD, traffic situation display, that's what this is here. And on a normal day at the peak, you know, pre-COVID and everything else, we'd have about 5,000 aircraft at the peak over the United States, okay? We moved about 44,000 a day. And once again, to answer your question, it's about 15,000 air traffic controllers. But when you're looking at this, you can see there's pretty much there's no weather over the states because everybody's pretty much going in their areas and they're doing well. Now, Inbound routes when they're weather. Now, this is what the person was talking about, individual with the question. If you notice these routes, they're not straight. Okay, you got guys bending around weather this way coming in. You got these routes that probably would have been only been straight, bending up to the north, coming in that way, and so forth to the south also. You can see this aircraft in particular, I can't pick them out, but how he came in this way over uh, Chesapeake, you know, West Virginia, Lois, India, Ohio, and Indiana, and then made a hard right turn up towards Chicago. So when you see here are the streams, we call these the overhead streams. And these are the highways that we are talking about. And believe it or not, if you put a center on it, these aircraft are all being lined up to meet in a nice, easy line right about here. So when you blend these streams, for example, this aircraft is first, second, third, fourth. You can tell that by looking at this, he's coming in behind him. He's gonna be slightly in front of him, depending how they run the route. You got this one here, it's in front of this aircraft. All these aircraft come in to this point, they'll be in line, then they line up again this way coming inbound. We, that's what you call by blending the overhead streams. And then from down south, you see the same thing this way. So even as you're doing this, you still got traffic going outbound, okay? So once again, to that question about with the routes, this is when air traffic goes in, we put in severe weather avoidance procedures or swap routes, and we move their routes. 
They may want to be going to New York this way. They may have to go south and then come back around and then back up towards New York. And this is where the pilot will come down the line and say, hey, uh, it's going to be a few minutes. I got to put extra fuel on so I can do that and I can make this route. Okay. That's what they would do. And as you can see here, these are the outbound aircraft. And once again, they're going out and they're going out and around, or they'll pick their way through if they think they can, or if they can, depending on the height of these clouds, these clouds here with the red in them are actually a little bit taller. So they probably would go around there, but these, they might think they might be able to pick their way through. That'd be, once again, you're sitting in the aircraft and a, and a fashion seat, uh, you know, fashion seat belt sign never turns off basically because they're flying through some turbulent air until they get out to this area then they may turn it off that's what they're doing they're picking their way through thunderstorms and usually when you're sitting there you can look out the window you see these nice beautiful clouds and like oh that's nice yeah they're, they're going around that and then usually those are the ones that when you're sitting say if you're in Iowa City or you know out west somewhere or St. Louis say oh you know we can't get to New York right now because of weather and you look at the clouds a couple of clouds in the sky you don't understand why this is why Okay, and these are the moments where TMU comes into effect. And like I showed you those different layers of airspace, they may take some airplanes and cap them, as you would say, and keep them at a lower altitude because they can kind of zip through there a little bit better than having to go up higher and getting into the thunderstorms that way. So actually with my degree in meteorology actually came in handy, it was in this for sure, because you know, when you're trying to figure out routes, you're also watching how well this is moving, how much is this gonna build up afterwards how fast, like I said, once again, the cells are building this way. So a route that may be open, say here now, may not be open if the weather's moving upwards. So you might run a few out this way quickly. And they say, okay, you're gonna have to wait a few minutes as the weather passes, then you can go back out to the south. So you do that, you know, pretty much in, in working with that. So having a good idea, a good grasp of what weather's gonna do or being a meteorologist, very handy for this type of work. So <laughs> when things go wrong, as somebody uh, asked, if you remember the Chicago Center fire and the outage, this is what it looked like on the scope. We had no aircraft, okay? And as you can see here, this is what it should like look like, something to that effect, or with the other air aircraft we showed with the pink. Um, when we went down like this, basically what we had to do was go non-radar, okay? So myself being trained in non-radar wasn't a problem. I understood it. I understood how to put people out over fixes, how to get them to join airways. A lot of the controllers that came in after me, you know, a lot after me, uh, they didn't train on non-radar because what they did, for example, in the Chicagoland area, we got four radar sites turning. So if one goes down, there's a backup to a backup to a backup. Okay. And then, so when we lost the radar out Chicago Center, we didn't lose the radar with the connection to the radar. What we wound up doing was um, going non-radar and they brought the center controllers to the towers, like to Midway and to O'Hare, so they could put in the, the uh, fixes and put in the routes because they were a lot more familiar with them than we were. And then we would launch guys. So what we did was we did everything on time, just like we used to do. This aircraft is, law, uh, is uh, departed. He can depart, say example, at 2000, void it off the ground by 2001. That's at eight o'clock to 8.01 or, or to uh, 8.03, for example, 2.003. And then that way you'd launch him and then behind him, the next guy would say he's released from 2.005, void if not off the ground by 2.008. And while you're doing that, you're launching, you're launching, and then they get to a certain point where Rockford could see him and Rockford was able to go up, the C-90 was able to work him. So what they did was make sure they were on the correct uh, flight path on the, on the uh, airway, and then we hand them off until they would get to a point where uh, Memphis, or not Memphis, uh, Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis sector, or center could see them because they were able to reach down a little bit. Same thing with Kansas City, and then they saw them, they went back to radar separation. But what we didn't do, we had no overflights. All the overflights had to go around. So that was a day that if a pilot put in a flight that he wanted to go to Los Angeles this way, not going to happen. He's going to go south, and then that way, and there's probably going to be some delay. So that's how we do that. Like I said, this redundancy built into the system. This is one of the systems where we had to come up with this uh, idea how we're going to do this. And this happened within a day's time or so. They were able to figure that out. Uh, another situation where you have inclement weather is like with snow removal or snow operations. Uh, like you see here at Midway Airport, we have the guys doing de-icing. And then you have the broom teams out. There's actually a certain science to it. Certain types of snow, you know, the fluffy, easy uh, snow is easier for brooms. Whereas the heaviest snow, the wet snow, they use the plows, just something to pick up along the way. And then once again, the broom teams and then the, uh, the snow blower, we actually piled up our snow and then we melted it. You know, it's only a square mile, wasn't many places to put it. So when we did that for air traffic de-icing, what you can only do 
after you de-ice an airplane, you have 15 minutes to get that aircraft out on the runway and depart. So you had to be very, very specific about how, who you de-iced here, how you de-iced, how many airplanes you de-iced, and how quickly you can get them going. And also in, in, in conjunction to getting the broom teams or the plow teams, that's what these are right here, <coughs> excuse me, out on the runway so they can keep the runway clear. Now, as you can see, there's X's on these runways here on the ASI, this is our surface radar, that show those runways as closed. That way we can just taxi in right to the de-icing spot and get them going. Typically when we did that, we would launch what we call the cross runway, coming across that way and then, you know, or land the cross runway and, and depart this runway. So that's, it's for efficiency, but that's basically what we did. And then you can see once again, the plow teams here. So with that in mind, yeah, this is what it looks like when they get it done. And this is the guy with the shovel and a lot of work in front of him, as we would say. Um, so when you have that at night, this is what it looks like from Midway Tower at night with some snow. It wasn't heavy snow, with some snow. Okay, so you can see this is the terminal here. That's what it would look like at night. You can see the blue lights. Those are taxiway lights. Okay, and then you have this, uh, this light here that's also green and alternating. That's actually a runway light uh, for high speed uh, off the runway, off of runway 13 center. And runway 31 center is going this way. Okay, so once again, you have your local controller, your ground controller, flight data specialist. And this area back here is the desk. As you can see, we're on 31 center, depicted on the, uh, on the map here, that uh, this is where the supervisor typically sits. So, we talk about a bad situation, for example, Southwest Airlines uh, 1248, and that was uh, December of, um, that went through, went through the fence. Some of you may remember that or not, I don't know, but uh, basically December 8th, 2005. So he was clear the land runway 31 center. Basically what happened was it was snowing so heavy, we could only see to about here, to the bullseye, okay? So here's the terminal over here, the tower here, the visibility, <clears throat> excuse me, like you saw in the last picture, was worse than this, where you could just barely see the terminal, and you can see the bullseye would actually be up here. You could barely see that. It was snowing just that heavy, okay? So the first aircraft that came in and landed was uh, Gulfstream. He landed, turned left at Alpha, exit the runway, no problem. We launched an aircraft for four right before him. After he landed, we saw him go through the bullseye. This is what this area is called right here. It's called the bullseye. He went through the bullseye. We launched again on four right. Then after that, um, Southwest came over. You know, we watched him come through and we lost sight of him right about in here. Then we loaded three one center, had four right loaded. And then after he came in through here, we were about ready to launch. And we asked uh, Southwest report clear of the runway because what we wanted to do was launch three one center, then runway four right. Southwest, are you clear of the runway? We're clear of the runway, he answered. Well, I want to know if he was on Bravo, which is this taxiway turning north, going out towards uh, to the terminal. And I asked the controller, because at the time we did not have ASDI, so we could not see him on surface radar. He says, no, we're off the field. Okay, we went off the field. So he wound up going off the end of the runway, through here, and landed and stopped right about here. That's where he stopped. So with that in mind, we couldn't see any of this, keep in mind. So we shut down the airport and there was the fire department. We reached out to the fire department, said the truck's out. So we didn't know where it was there, but the, the, the uh, policy at the fire department, they go and they check the whole runway, which is what they did. Now, within that time frame, we still had an aircraft sitting on the runway here. Obviously, we're not going to launch this one because we don't know where he is on this part of the runway. But we had a guy here, okay? And this is what somebody was asking about as far as, you know, situations. The book says, as soon as you close the airport, that's it. I don't care if the guy was sitting on the runway, the engine's filed up, ready to go. He's not going. And when I called the fire department out and said that we had aircraft off the airport, he's sitting here. So while he's sitting here, there's a guy coming into work into the maintenance facility, and he happened to miss the light. He didn't make the light. So he's sitting at the light right here, 55th and Central, okay? And all of a sudden, a big plume of snow, and he looks out his window, and there's a Southwest Airlines sitting there. He calls over to the, to the AMC, he said, hey, there's a plane in the street. They say, we know the fire department's rolling. We're rolling trucks, everything else. What we didn't know at that time, as soon as they did that, these guys that were doing snow removal and all the city ops over here, they started crossing the runway to go to the accident site. But since the runway's closed or the airport's closed, they can do that. And by simply following the rule, even though you're sitting here, the fire trucks are here, that guy taxi back to the gate. 
that's how you avoid certain things. A lot of times the rules are put in place because of other incidents or accidents that may have happened long before you came on the, on the job, but they're there for a reason. So when you follow that, it usually keeps you out of trouble. That was a sad situation. That, uh, a child did wind up losing their life in that. But as far as we were concerned, we did everything we were supposed to. We didn't wind up with a lawsuit as far as I was concerned, you know, but there was loss of life. So any questions? Yeah, so we're right about at time. So I'm going to group a couple more questions together. Um, thank you for everybody who submitted questions uh, so far. There's a lot still here. So okay. the, fir <laughs> the first group will be about communication with uh, planes. So the first part of the question is how do you communicate with aircraft over the oceans beyond the line of sight uh, limit of most communications? And then the second question, kind of contradictory to that, um, with such sophisticated technology, how were the two planes lost a couple of years ago? Um, how are they not able to be found, um, even though there were those long searches? Uh, so we're talking about the lost aircraft over by, by Vietnam and Malaysia. Is that what we're talking about? I, I think that's what they're referencing. Yeah, that, that in itself, I have my own speculation on that, which I'm not going to go into, but they should have been able to figure out just by the telemetry and, and the path to where the aircraft was flying, that uh, where that aircraft should be. Um, aside from that, you know, although it is ADSB and we do have satellites and we do have things to do that, we as the United States, we don't run that airspace. So I don't know specifically how that is done and how they are doing that and not being able to see where that aircraft went. And I'll just kind of leave that at that. Um, as far as talking to aircraft, uh, yes, now they do use satellites to bounce the signals over to talk to the airplanes as far as that's concerned. Uh, radio, what they typically had done, they had different stations that they would tune into and would bounce the signal, say, from Greenland or Iceland, Greenland, Canada, down to whatever facility, which would be New York. You know, they would do it that way um, as far as getting, uh, you know, uh, keeping in contact with aircraft over the open ocean. That's typically how they, they normally do it. And you, you go to some places, they have uh, long range uh, radio signals that they're able to use. That kind of uh, goes a little bit further than just line of sight. So we do have that. And then what I'll do for our last question, a couple grouped in and I'll, I'll read one question out directly as it is, because I think it's very detailed. Okay. Um, question reads, what would happen if a pilot were to disregard ATC's instructions? For instance, if they requested flight level 380 to avoid heavy chop and ATC denied the request, but the pilot changed altitude anyway, deeming it necessary for safety, what kind of investigation procedures are in place to follow up? And then the second question that came in was about, have you ever had to reprimand a pilot for not doing, doing or not doing something that had been communicated? Uh, the second question, yes. <laughs> I've had reprimanded a uh, few pilots along my career for not doing what they were supposed to do, especially when uh, what they did had endangered other pilots. Now, with the first question, and say if he wants to say flight level 380 and he was told to descend or to turn or whatever, if the pilot says, I have to do this for the safety of the aircraft, typically what controllers will let that go, try to move other aircraft away from that until they get past that, and then it would be an inquiry, if not an investigation, to why that pilot did not follow those instructions. Uh, if he was just to try to continue on and not follow any further instructions, or instructions, at that point, we would probably have the military involved and he would probably get an escort. That's pretty much what would happen at this point. Um, I think the first question as far as uh, pilots who I've had to speak to, I've had a pilot a long time ago depart when VFR flight was not recommended, but it was still VFR. He left out of the field, uh, lost his uh, electrics about five, or maybe about, about five miles south of Midway, turned around, came back. We knew he came back because we had a primary target. You know, basically the, the radar was painting him, had to stop all the departures until he came in and landed, couldn't talk to him until he landed, but wound up having to stop like five or six airplanes, you know, Boeings going out for an individual who probably should not have, no, not even probably should not have gone out in the first place. So we wound up doing that. That was something that I got FISDO involved and they had to talk to those pilots. So I think I'm gonna hand it off to Linda now. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Thank you, Mike. It was fantastic. I now sat through it a couple of times. I keep learning more and more and it's terrific. So okay. I want to thank you very, very much for um, this special webinar. I want to thank Alex and Rebecca again for facilitating this and we really appreciate it. 
We thank you very, very much for to Brandeis uh, for partnering with us. We're both, Jen and I are both from Phoenix, as we mentioned, and it's 112 degrees down, down a little bit cooler from 116, 117. So wherever you are, enjoy. Um, we wanted to tell you, we have another webinar that we're partnering again with, and it's on the, um, July 31st. It's one o'clock Eastern time. And it's somebody who is, at, his name is Paul Rockauer. He's a Brandeis alumni who credits Brandeis for his entire career. And he had the opportunities that they afforded him to travel and um, all around the world. He was particularly, particularly involved with Middle East for a long time. He speaks six languages. He's traveled to 85 countries. And so we hope you'll join us again. It's one o'clock Eastern time on July 31st. And um, we really, again, thank Mike very, very much and have a wonderful day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.